What's going on, everyone? Josh White here. Thank you so much for tuning back into the Hero Front Podcast. And we are just getting started, y'all, because last week we met Kate Hewlett. We heard all about the things that inspire her and really the origin story of her journey. But we're just getting started because it's a three-part series and we're rolling into part two this week. So thank you for joining us again. So just this past Friday, I was invited to Command Chief Corey Olson's retirement ceremony. And you would have thought you were at AFSA or AFA because everyone was at his retirement because he's been in for 32 years, half of which is... Uh, top secret stuff. I mean, the guy is just next level. I've never heard a bad thing about him. And that's super rare for someone in his position to just be so loved by his airmen, his peers, his leaders. It was incredible. But I want to thank uh, Kate for also inviting me because I was able to interview Lieutenant General Jim Slife. That's right. A three-star general will be on Hero Front uh, you will see that episode in the next few weeks. And that's all thanks to Kate for setting that up. So I just want to thank her for that. And lastly, on this past Friday, I was able to talk to Chief Bass herself about Hero Front, where she looked me right in the eyes and told me to keep going and we need to spread more positivity. Um, and that just meant the world to me. And what I told everyone at that retirement ceremony was that the day I met Kate, my life has never been the same. I, I told everyone that. Uh, hopefully I didn't embarrass her too much, but it is the truth. She does lift those up around her in a way in which I've never seen before. This week, this is the hard part of the conversation, and I want to give a trigger warning for anyone who is very sensitive to the topic of losing someone to suicide, because that's part of what we're going to talk about today, uh, and it does get emotional. So here's the three topics that we go over. Topic one is journey to commissioning. The second topic is how Kate was diagnosed with MS. And the third topic, which is gonna go into part three, is making each day count. So if you know Kate, you know she's a go-getter. In the beginning of this episode, we hear how she was actually a military spouse. When she was waiting to commission, she was waiting for her opportunity, she had to kind of take a backseat to her husband's career, and that was not easy for her, but she learned so much about our enlisted, so much about our military spouses, that it just made her a more well-rounded person and in this first part of this episode i think for anyone that is struggling to reach a goal for anyone that has reached huge setbacks to the point where they're considering quitting then this episode's for you all right so we have three topics here yeah First topic, journey to commissioning. Second topic, diagnosed with MS. And the third topic, making each day count. So these all kind of play into your story. You know, they all kind of have a, a little bit of overlap. Yeah. But with the journey to commissioning, it sounded like you, you heard no a lot. You hit a lot of roadblocks. And so I was hoping you could just start us off with your journey to commissioning and how you battled hearing no constantly. Yeah. Um, re reflecting on, um, a lot of this stuff and, and kind of did my, my prep work and kind of look back at, at a bunch of things and, um, really made me laugh because, um, kind of my entire, um, Air Force career, the Air Force has been telling me that it's, um, not particularly interested in me. <laughs> so it was, um, I was like, wow, you know, I guess I can't take a hint very well. Um, so, uh, I started out, um, I always knew I wanted to be a pilot. Um, I mean, there was a very weird period when I was a kindergartner where for some reason I thought I wanted to be a maid and a nun. Um, and oh, again, wow. anyone who knows me will just be laughing their ass off right now because it's just kind of hilarious to think about. Um, but it, it was really quickly after that, that I learned, um, that I wanted to be a pilot going to these air shows. Um, and knew I wanted to be in the Air Force. You know, my dad was Army First Cav in Vietnam, and so his service really, really inspired me. But, you know, going to those air shows and seeing, seeing the pilots, I was like, it, it's got to be Air Force. Like, there's nothing else for me. It's got to be Air Force. Um, 
And so I, I went to the University of Missouri, um, started out doing Air Force ROTC, um, and that's where I met my husband, Mike, who, um, you know, we fell in love pretty quickly. And then, again, weird life happened. Um, at the time, they were being pretty strict about um, when you had contracted to commission. Um, and he ended up running out of money to finish college. Um, so you had to enlist. Yes. Well, so there, there were two options. It was pay back any of the scholarship money he had received. So he had received a, a small scholarship, um, which helped out with some things. And, and he, he was a factory worker before going to college. Um, so he saved up a bunch to be able to go to college. Um, and it, it just didn't um, last the whole way. Um, and so it was either pay back any scholarship money um, that you did receive and don't go into the military or enlist. Um, you know what's crazy before you get into that? I met a guy in that same situation in basic training yeah. in 2004. No joke. Yeah. The guy was so mad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, I don't know if he failed the academy or something went wrong yeah. with his officer deal. Mm -hmm. And this guy was really upset. And then I, I couldn't believe it, but like he got out of it because uh, RTI was like started talking to him and she didn't agree with forcing him into that. Wow. And she got him out of the service. Wow. And then he was a firefighter back in like Colorado or something. Yeah. Um, so he went back to doing that. But she got him out of that. Yes. Yeah. I've never, I still never forget it to this day, you know. Yeah. And, and, and for us, it, it, there, there was no option because we both still wanted to be in the, in the Air Force and we wanted to serve. Um, so, it, it, you know, we talk about being ready for whatever life has to throw at you. You know, we had a very, straight and narrow path to where we thought we were going to get to be. You know, you go to college, you go through ROTC, you commission, you go to pilot training, you're there. Um, that's not at all what happened um, for either of us. Um, and so he ended up enlisting. Um, he was civil engineering, prime beef at um, Little Rock Air Force Base. Um, and I left college to be with him. We, we got married. Um, and that was weird for me. Um, it, was a, it was a huge identity crisis. So... Were you in the military at this point? No. So I, I was in um, ROTC. So you're still... Yeah, okay. so a civilian. So you don't have a rank in ROTC? No. No. Okay. I mean, you've got a cadet rank, but, you know, okay. I was, I was a, a sophomore. So it's to teach you the structure, but it's not necessarily a rank. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So you're so, still a civilian. Yep. And then he's an enlisted airman? Yes. Yeah. He went through basic training. Yep. So he did what I saw that guy do, yes. but he didn't get out of it. He went through basic training. Correct. Yeah. He oh, said, wow. I, I, will, I will enlist um, because I want to be in the military. I gotta say, good on him, man. Yeah. He didn't give up either. My yeah. God, y'all two were incredible. Well, I gotta tell you, I mean, it was one of the best things I think that that could have happened too, because um, you know we we went and did this thing, and we learned so much that I think has made us better um, officers. Because for me, being a civilian spouse was quite the identity crisis because I had been working towards my own commission, I had my own goals, I knew I wanted to be in the Air Force, and suddenly. I didn't have my own identity. I wasn't Kate. I was Mike's wife. And that was really difficult to deal with for me. You know, it was like my friend group was built for me. It was, I was the supposed to be friends with all of the spouses of my husband's coworkers. And, and it was just very bizarre. And luckily all of them were phenomenal. Um, so you kind of just got roped into this role that people expected you to fill. Yes. And they yeah. saw you a certain way because you're this active duty enlisted spouse. Absolutely. And they just put you in that bucket. Yeah. And you're we, like, wait, but I've got all these other things I'm doing and okay, I'm just yeah. a spouse. Which is a, a fantastic bucket to be in. And I don't in any way mean to downplay that. And boy, the respect that I, I gained from that, um, th there is, and I'm happy to say this, there is no more difficult um, job in the military than a spouse. Definitely. Because you give up who you are and what you want, um, and, and you support another person, and that is your your job and your role. Even even if um, you know you you have your own career, like that that is the role of a military spouse. Yeah, my it, wife had her degree when I met. She yeah. she was way farther. She's younger than me, but she was way farther as far as like a career is going. Mm -hmm. She could have went so much farther yeah and yeah she she went with me um and yeah there were there's definitely sacrifices and, and then you know we're stressed out mm -hmm. from x y or z and we come home and vent and just the amount of moving and you yeah. know it, it's 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 rough it's brutal it, it's it's so much sacrifice and it's sacrifice 
for your country and it's sacrifice for your spouse um, and your family and, and freedom and, and, you know, what a, what an incredibly high calling there is to do that. And they're not the ones who get thanked, you know, it's, you know, the, the military member is the one who's like, Oh, thank you for your service. But they're the ones who have to stay home and, and keep the home front down while we're off getting to do what we've always wanted to do with our lives. So, right. um, and what an amazing perspective you and is it Mike's your husband? Yes. You and Mike have like, you have the enlisted perspective and yeah. you have the spouse perspective and yeah. now you're officers. Yeah. And, and that was huge for my husband to get that, um, enlisted perspective because you know, the, the way that they teach you to be an officer, um, is it, very much from the, the leadership role, the kind of top down role, but to see it from the bottom up and say, mm -hmm. okay, this is what I respected in these individuals. This is what, you know, I don't want to do as a leader. Um, such a valuable lesson to get to see that and, and then get to try and be that every day for our airmen. So I, I don't, I don't think we would have changed it. You know, if we could go back and do it all over again, I think we do it exactly the same. Um, because what we both learned was invaluable to us and I think it's made us who we are as officers now. And so, um, yeah, we, it's we amazing. just valued our time doing that so much. And, um, when that was, um, when his enlistment was up, we went, we went back to college. Um, but they had changed how they were doing, um, your allocation for, for getting your field training slot and then commissioning. Um, you had to get it in your sophomore year. And so Mike would have had to redo his sophomore, junior and senior year. That's out of the question. Yeah. I would have had to redo my sophomore year and we're like, oh man, that's going to delay us so much. No, we'll just do OTS. Um, little did we know how difficult it is to apply to OTS, like what a process and, and how long that takes. Um, so we both finished our degrees and we both applied. And um, the application process took a long time. Um, it, 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 extensive and very, very thorough. Um, but when we did apply, so my husband got picked up, um, and I did not during the, the first board. Um, and I mean, so that's kind of a double whammy. Like you already went along for his ride, his yeah. journey. Now he got picked over before yeah. you. Yeah. Oof. Like that had to have stung. It, it did. And not that he didn't deserve it. Cause my, my husband is brilliant. Um, he is, um, just a, an incredibly intelligent individual and he's a, a killer pilot. Like he is phenomenal. So, you know, his scores, uh, he deserved it a million percent. Um, for me, um, there, there's something that's called a PIXM score, um, which I can't, I can't even tell you what the acronym means, but it's, it's essentially supposed to be your percentage likelihood that you will pass, um, pilot training or flight training. Okay. And so it's out of a hundred. Um, and so, um, I think for me, when I first applied, I think mine was something like a 55, like it was pretty low, but it, it's this like algorithmic combination of your pilot score on the air force officer qualification test, um, any sort of civilian flight hours you might have. And then, um, the score from, um, a test called your TBAS. Um, I think it's something like threat battery aptitude test. Um, but it, it's supposed to test your hand eye coordination and your motor skills. Um, wow. Okay, so there's a lot that goes into this this score. There is a lot, um, and they don't ever tell. So they'll tell you your PIXM score, and you know your pilot um, score on the AFOQT, and you know your flight hours. They'll never tell you what your TBAS score is. Um, because it's, it's this kind of protected algorithmic combination. Um, but for me, I, I, I wasn't a video gamer. Like I, you know, I, I'm happy to sit there and, and watch if it's got a good story, but it, it just kind of was never big for me other than playing Top Gun, um, as a little kid in, in the eighties. Um, on Nintendo? Yeah. <laughs> Bro, I could never land yeah. that plane though, right? That's where the game ended. Man, that aircraft carrier. That I was, that I was don't abuse. know how you land. I, yeah. To this day, I don't know <laughs> how you would land that plane. It right. just never worked. <laughs> yeah, love that game. Um, did, did do some uh, the, some Super Mario Brothers, but um, not a big gamer. And, and I think that's honestly um, what hurt me in the first one. Um, and so didn't get picked up. Um, and, and really, devastation is not a strong enough word to mm. encompass how I felt. Um, and and you know, sucked for my husband too because he th this huge achievement. He doesn't want to celebrate it in front of you, right? He's yeah. like, yeah, oh, yeah. So he's like. You know, walking on eggshells. Absolutely. Yeah, he he knew how he devastating. Doesn't want to upset you. Yeah, and that's he. How how can he be happy when his wife is so upset and let down? Yeah, and, and certainly part of it is my fault because I was I was very upset. Um, and so you know, him being sensitive to that, it he couldn't celebrate it as much as he deserved to. Um, so 
Yeah, how did you take that? The day that, because I've heard you tell the story before, but I'd never heard you go into detail. So to go into detail, how did you take that news the day that that happened? Yeah, um, I, I definitely tried to be happy for my husband because I was incredibly proud of him. You know, he, again, he absolutely deserved it. Um, but but the work that I had put into into those applications for both of us, making sure we were both squared away. Um, and again, this was this was my dream. And um, quite frankly, my my husband was not as interested in applying as I was um, because I think his experience being enlisted kind of um, was. It, it, it kind of skewed his view a little bit because having been in ROTC and trained to be an officer um, and then seeing some not great examples of leaders was difficult for him. And I think he was like, I know what you're supposed to be trained to do. I know how you're supposed to be treating and taking care of people. And I'm not necessarily seeing that in everyone. Um, he had a, a couple of really great officers, but there, there were some leaders that just weren't um, what you're supposed to be. There are some people who just get better at being toxic. Yes. They just yeah. they just get great at doing that. Yeah. And, and that's true in life. But, you know, when you're in the military, that's, that's tough to take when you know the ideal and you, you know what it's supposed to be. Right. Um, Especially and so, his perspective. Holy cow. What a unique yeah. airman that he must have been. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, he, he wasn't overly jazzed about it um, mm. just because it, it really kind of rocked um, his, his belief in a lot of things to, yeah. to see that. Um, and so I, you know, I kind of forced the issue. I was like, well, this is what I'm doing for my life. And you said this is what you want. So, so we're So would you applying. say like his, his commitment and his faith was challenged by being let down in a few areas? Yeah. Is that where he was at? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I think um, the, the support or lack thereof that he found when it, when it was time to enlist was really difficult for him. Um, and so it, it and was a when challenge. You, when you have these other opportunities and to, this is just from my experience, when I retrained, I expected everyone to love that news and this, this goal and they yeah. all hated it yeah you know they said no you're not going anywhere mm -hmm. and you know threw my paperwork in the trash and <laughs> i had to get my dad involved i don't tell him a lot, a lot. that's the only time i asked my dad to help me with my career like when he still had leverage in the air yeah. force because i was like they're throwing my freaking package and like literally in the trash because they don't want me to leave you know um it's like crabs in a in a bucket mindset sometimes yep. Um, and so, you know, if he felt that or saw that in any way, that's incredibly disheartening to yeah. feel that when you expect everyone to support you and you get the opposite reaction, you know? Yeah. And, and I think, I think he kind of lost, um, his why and he lost his purpose a little mm. bit. Um, he didn't have that torchbearer. Yeah. Yeah. Jeez. And, and so it, for him, it, it, it was difficult, um, making the decision to apply and really, I kind of made the decision for him. So that um, must have made you like really mad, you know, to, to, yeah. not only did you not get it, but now the person who did wasn't even like all in on it. It was just like, no, nah, I might not. And you're like, wait, what? Yeah. yeah. You had to have been losing your mind. Wait, and, and less mad at him more like, um, God, what you doing here? Like it, it, it definitely kind of rocked my faith where like my, my whole life, I knew this is what I wanted to do. Um, and so to really see for the first time that the air force was saying, we, d we don't want you I mean, that's, that's what they said is we do not want you. We're not picking you. Um, was really difficult to see something I've dreamed of my whole life, um, potentially not going to happen. Um, what'd you do that day? Um, I cried a lot. Um, <laughs> so just yeah. weeping. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm a crier anyway. Like if I have any emotion at all, it leaks out of my eyeballs. Um, but that, that was just, you know, I, I was really rocked by that. Um, I did actually end up calling up one of our, our buddies, um, who we had been in Air Force ROTC with and, and was, um, actually one of the best men at our wedding, um, Tom Layden. And I called him and I said, Hey, can you take Mike out? Like, he deserves to celebrate this. And like, I am not in an emotional place to celebrate him the way that he deserves. And so I asked him to take Mike out. Um, of course they brought me along, but, um, I, I was, I was trying to find ways for him to be able to be celebrated when kind of knowing that that was not within my capacity at that time. Um, right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm so sorry that you went through that. That's, it, it hurts my heart. Cause I, you know, we've all felt that at some point. Yeah. So, to that level, that's that's intense. Yeah. And with the husband making it, and then he wasn't sure if he wanted to do it. I mean, holy, no. wow. And to be clear, when he got picked up for pilot, like he was like, okay, 
this is what I've always wanted yeah. to do. All right. Now, now I know I'm on, on back on the path that I was meant to be on. I hope his faith has been restored. Yeah. Um, has his faith been restored? Man, yeah. Especially, um, his current position, he yeah. is so in love with it. Um, cause he, he's a, he's an incredible instructor. Um, which, you know, feel free to edit that, edit that out of the podcast because I don't want him to know that I just said that because um, he's been my instructor a few times and, and I give him a lot of uh, grief and a lot of trouble where I'm like, I don't want to learn that. Um, but he's a really, really good instructor. Um, so he, uh, yeah, and we'll, we'll get into that when we talk about the, the MS stuff and, and the ways that he's ended up kind of needing to be my instructor, but um, wow. he's really good. Wow. Okay. And he loves teaching again it's yeah. it's that investment in people mm -hmm. um the fact that he can take um a young aviator and kind of mold them and shape them and um so he he is a t1 instructor and so that's kind of the later phase of um this CISO training or or navigator training um and so he gets to see them right kind of before they get their their aircraft um selection and um especially for the ones who are in the so track or the special operations track for him to get to talk to them about special operations and, and the career path and and um you know there is no better magcom for a navigator than Air Force Special Operations Command. They they know the value of what the CISO brings to the fight. Um, we cannot do the missions um, without them. And so um, we are just fierce advocates for AFSOC, especially within um, the CISO school. And so he loves getting to do that. Man, he comes home every day just pumped and jazzed and excited about the students, um, excited about what he gets to do. His leadership there is phenomenal um, and incredibly supportive um, and his his commander Colonel Patrick Derig is um, an AFSOC guy and so um, I I've, in, in Colonel Derig I have never seen anyone who people so aggressively need to tell you that they're an amazing officer um, as soon as people hear that that's where my my husband is and who he's working for people are like oh my god let me tell you how well, great he is. Um, I mean, people like that are pretty special. I've come it, to learn if they can, yeah. if they got that kind of response from people, then they're doing something right. It, it, it is on a different level than I have seen of any other officer enlisted anyone. It, it's pretty cool. And my husband gets to see it every day, getting to work for him. He's the, uh, the chief of OGV or the standards wow. and evaluations. And so, um, yeah, his faith, especially in this assignment has absolutely been restored, um, especially after working in, in AFSOC and all the amazing missions we got to support and the soft troops that we got to support, yeah. and then now getting to see um, the beginnings of that with our, our navigators and, and getting to invest from the very beginning. Yeah, he is Wow. He is all in. Yeah. That's amazing. I'm so happy for y'all. Yeah. For real. Like, just everything you've been through and just to be here now and, and kicking ass the way you are is just, it's just amazing. It's very inspiring. It, it, it's been a weird, a weird path for both of us. Um, cause you know, when, when Mike got picked up, I, I didn't know what I was going to do after that. Um, and so shortly after Mike got picked up, he went to officer training school, which isn't typically how it goes. Typically you wait around for several, several, several months. Um, but he was, he was up against, um, an age restriction. And so they had to get him, um, in, into training. And so he was, I think it was just like a couple months that he, he was starting. Yeah. Cause I think we found it in like November. And, and so he started in March the following year. Um, and so while he's there telling me about OCS and all of his training and stuff, you know, I'm, I'm at home, um, still in college going through, um, or uh, sorry, I was working by that point, um, in, in our college town, um, and just not knowing what to do. And then, um, your application, um, or back then at least, your application automatically rolled over to the next um, look um, if it was within the same fiscal year. <clears throat> and so I was out there for at Maxwell Air Force Base for his graduation ceremony. Um, and for some weird reason, our recruiter had been calling my husband all week long. Um, he's like, I don't know why he's calling me, which again was weird because I had been the one talking to him and working with him the whole time. So it was weird that he was calling my husband and not me. And then I had just gotten my hair done to go to his dining out celebration. And I was in the elevator on my way up to like put my dress on and go to the celebration. And the next day was his commissioning. Um, and you know, the recruiter finally called me and I answered and I was like, look, unless you have good news, I do not need to hear that OTS doesn't want me while I'm here at OTS, um, graduation. Right. And, um, you know, my recruiter said, well, what, 
would you consider good news? Um, cause I had applied for pilot first on my application and, and navigator second. Um, and I was like, well, that I got selected. And he said, well, congratulations, you're going to be a combat systems officer. Um, and I had to ask what that was. Um, cause they had just changed the title of navigator to combat systems officer. Um, and when he told me and I realized I was going to get to be an officer and an aviator in the air force, I lost it. I, I started crying like an idiot so hard that like my family was down the hall and they heard me crying and thought someone had died. Like they, they were like, what they were like, occurred? what, are you okay? What is hap What happened? Yeah. And there are tears of joy. Yeah. I was, that after yeah. all that, everything you've been through. Yeah. It's kind of made even more sweet now because like you're celebrating your husband, but now you get to celebrate you this time at the same time. Yeah. Which was cool because um, I had made really good friends with a lot of the spouses of um, all the t OTs going through at the time. And so they knew that this is something I was going towards. And so to get to go to the club that night and to tell them I got selected, they were over the moon, overjoyed for me. Um, and, and I'm still very good friends with a lot of those um, spouses still. They're amazing. Um, and, and like you said, I don't think I would have appreciated it at, as much. If I had gotten picked up the first time, um, I, I probably would have been a little bit disappointed that it wasn't a pilot slot um, or wouldn't have appreciated it as much as I did because um, once I did get picked up, all I cared about was being an officer. Um, and of course I wanted to fly, but um, I knew I wanted to be in the Air Force. And so... So kind of forced yeah. you to look at what you cared about the most. It, exactly. And right. appreciate it. Um, and again, it was, it was God telling me where I needed to go. Um, because I loved being a navigator. I absolutely loved it. it yeah, that it, sounds like a really cool... I saw a picture of you, you know, navigating. Yep. Sitting in, <laughs> it looked really cool. Like, yeah. And I was really happy to see that picture because I was like, man, to think that, like, she almost gave up on her dream and now she's in this aircraft on real world stuff. Yeah. That had to have been like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm here right now. Like, it's like a movie. Yeah, it, I mean, it's it, the... The career that I got to do as well with um, being a navigator, because um, I got to be in the MC-130P Combat Shadow 2, or Combat Shadow, um, that, gosh, that the lineage and the heritage of that aircraft, um, the things that it has done, the, the missions that the men and women have been on, um, the, the troops that they have supported, it, it is so humbling to be a part of um, such a storied history, um, both in Air Force Special Operations Command and within the MC-130P um, community. It was, it was humbling and an honor. And for me, there was no better, um, mission set for me. Um, when I was going through, um, nav school, um, Mike was going through pilot training. And so he was, he ended up getting his drop list of aircraft that he could choose from, um, right as I was finishing up my first phase of navigator school. And so he and I were sitting there looking through the list to say, you get to rack and stack and say, okay, this is kind of what we'd like. And then the Air Force says, okay, well, here's what you get based off of how you did in the class and, and kind of what, what you'd like to do. Um, and so we were kind of struggling with, you know, what, what do we pick first? And we had talked about slick 130s, which we call slicks, um, anything that's um, not modified, um, so, like, it wouldn't be an MC-130, AC-130, um, EC-130. Um, it's a, a, a C-130. Um, we, we call them slicks. Um, and so we had talked about it a lot because that was the mission at, at Little Rock Air Force Base. So they, they had held a special place in our heart from um, his time being enlisted. And, um, you know, like every young um, aviator, I thought I wanted fighters. Um, and I ended up talking to my flight commander and he's like, look, Kate, I, I don't think you're going to be satisfied with fighters. I don't think you're going to be satisfied with slicks. Um, for you, he's like, it, it doesn't matter the vehicle. He's like, you don't, you don't want the sexy aircraft. You want the sexy mission. Find what the mission is. I never thought of it that way, but yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. It, and that was, God, that was pivotal for me because, um, you know, like we talk about your purpose, um, that that's the mission. What are you supporting? What do you like to do? Um, and so we ended up putting all the AFSOC aircraft, number one on my husband's list, and he got the MC-130B Combat Shadow. And um, not a lot of people know what it is. We didn't know um, a lot about that mission. Um, but then as I went through navigator school, all of the missions of the MC-130P were all the things that I love to do, like um, low level um, radar scope interpretation, airdrop, um, self protect. Like um, the very cool thing about the MC 130s, um, any of the variants is 
the M stands for multi-role. So like the AC-130 is attack and they've got the guns. Um, EC-130 is electronic and they do electronic warfare and, and so on and so forth. Um, so the M and MC-130 stands for multi-role. And so the mission set is so varied. It, it's the most diverse mission set of any aircraft in the Air Force inventory. And you just get to do something different every single night. Um, and wow. to get to support that was amazing. Um, and there's no better role that I could have had as a navigator. Um, and so I, I, I would have stayed a, a navigator in the MC-130P forever if I could have versus being a pilot in anything at that point. Um, I loved it. Um, but they wow. ended up retiring the aircraft and I was lucky enough to take the last one to the boneyard. Um, no way. Yeah, it was. Wow. That was, that's, that's a story we'll, we'll talk about, um, later. Um, cause Lord knows, um, we've gone crazy over time for this, um, episode, but, um, there, there's some good stories, um, from re retiring her. That was just such a, a privilege and a blessing to get to be, um, technically the last mission navigator on the MC 130P, um, was amazing. You were part of history. Yeah. Yeah. It was, God, that was cool. Um, that is amazing. Yeah. You've done so many cool things. I, I don't know. You're so purposeful and full of intent. Like, just just crazy things happen to you that like would just the way it all lines up. I don't know. Yeah, it it's it's weird. It's yeah. been it's been a weird journey. And again, you know, like you're talking about the way things line up because, um, you know, clearly not my decision to re retire my aircraft. Um, but because of that, it was kind of forced me because I had to retrain, and so. Um, I would have to go retrain in another aircraft. And so I was like, well, might as well go crazy and fully retrain. Um, and so I applied to pilot training. I said, you know, maybe this is God telling me this is the time. Um, so I got to do the very best job for any navigator in the Air Force on the best aircraft in the inventory. Um, and then got to go apply to pilot training and got picked up for it that time. Um, and again, we kind of talked about that pick some score. I think it was like two or three weeks before I, I retook it um, for my new application. I did nothing but play video games. Um, really? And I ended up, um, and I, and I re, I, I had more civilian flight hours at that time. So I did, I did a bunch of other things to kind of increase my score, but, um, I ended up having something like a 90, 93, 95 Dang. pick some, um, something, something like that. That's um, don't, don't quote me on that, but it was definitely in the nineties. Right. Um, so significant boost, um, for that and so got picked up um to go to pilot training and so 2015 um after retiring the shadow i went i went to pilot training at uh columbus air force base and then what aircraft did you get uh the mc-130j um commando 2 so it is the kind of um new version of um both the mc-130p and the mc-130h um both again um, multi-role aircraft within um the soft community um but this is the new um c-130j version of that and so the same mission set um a lot of the same people from that community and um there was nothing else i wanted um I can't imagine doing any other mission, you know, even as I think about potentially, you know, if I get to retrain again, um, I, I can't think of anything else I'd, I'd ever want to do. I, I am so passionate about special operations command. I'm so passionate about the mission of the MC 130. Um, it's hard to fathom doing anything else. So, um, there, there were only two AFSOC aircraft on my drop list. And unfortunately I had done a really good job of selling my class on how great AFSOC was. And so everyone wanted AFSOC oh and, uh, I was, I was pretty terrified, um, but, but thrilled that, you know, I, I had done well enough in my class that I was able to get my number one choice and, and go back to that, um, aircraft net mission set. So, wow. Yeah. Look at you go. <laughs> you're like, shoot, I was, now, I'll just fly a plane now. Like, how do I do that? Yeah. Okay. Now you're flying a plane now. <laughs> like what in the world? It's crazy. It all started with that little girl seeing the, the air show. Yeah. That's what's crazy. Yeah. You know, we both have that in common where, you know, we were both with our dads at air shows. Yep. So I know how special, you know, those moments were. Absolutely. So that, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, but you did go through, so yeah, I have epic wing story, <laughs> <laughs> the epic wing story. Uh, and then we also have a very, you know, trying time for you being the senior ranking member uh, in your class. Yeah. Correct. Where mm -hmm. a lot of these folks fell underneath you and a lot of them went through uh, some tremendously hard times and you being a leader you were kind of in the thick of it if you would yeah 
Um, so I was hoping to hear uh, about those two things. Yeah. Um, so uh, navigator school, um, much like pilot training, um, it kind of culminates with winging. So you've earned your navigator wings. Um, this is this big ceremony, um, really important, really huge uh, day, just culmination of, of months and months and months of work. I think it was 11 months um, of training. And my husband was at Little Rock at the time going through C-130 training um, prior to going to his mission call. And uh, the timing was a bit unfortunate because where he was in the training um, and the day of my graduation, it was there's there was certain training that they just couldn't move. Um, and so they're like, well, you know, you can take the last flight out that day and we'll try and get you done. Um, so this is the navigator side. Yeah. And you about to, this is like your tech school, essentially, and you're about to be graduated. You will be a navigator and, and you're trying to get your husband there on that special day yeah. to celebrate you and this crazy long training that you had to do. Yeah. It's, it's, it is a huge day, um, for any you said 11 aviator. months. Yeah. Oof. Yeah. That's, so that was, um, navigator school and I think pilot training is 13. Um, wow. or was um, they're doing a ton of stuff right now to kind of revolutionize um, what they're doing with pilot training but yeah 11, 11 months and for me it was again so many weird barriers uh, it was extra long because I spent about nine months on casual status um, prior to even starting my training um, after commissioning because um, they, they had again they were redoing um, the curriculum to be um, based on a combat system officer versus um, they had been doing uh, navigator EWO and um, uh, uh, weapons uh, systems officer prior to that um, and so this was your you're, you're getting a bit of training and all of that um, but then also like um, I got injured at OTS and so I was um, spent a lot of time on on profile and, and you have to pass a PT test um, prior to getting to do your your very first flight training in, in Pueblo Colorado and so I was on hold for a bit um, before starting so nine months and then 11 months of training um, so wow. again, you know, just, I can't do anything the easy way is, is yeah, basically what we've established. If, if you're in some sort of training environment, profiles do not mix with that. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? That's the, that's like the worst time you could ever have. Cause you, they don't let you do anything until that's, that's off. Yeah. It was, um, so that was, that was really, that was difficult and a lot of like physical therapy and, and trying to work to get to where I could pass the PT test and was able to once I, I got out there. So that was, that was great. But yeah, again, delayed me, but again, you know, God knows what he's doing. Cause my, my class at, at, um, CISO training was phenomenal. And, and this is where I met, um, major Rose Chapman, who, um, is one of my best friends, um, major Dan Sullivan, who's, um, also a dear lifelong friend. So, um, just, huge in terms of how well we got along, how well we supported each other and took care of each other. Um, such a great group of people. And so, so you were meant I'm, to meet these. Oh people. yeah, absolutely. Like they, they will be friends of mine for the rest of my life um, yeah. because of this. So, you know, there, there's so many times where I'm like, man, why is this happening in my life? And then I look back and I'm like, all right, thanks God. You knew what you were doing. So, so did your husband make it to, the wings ceremony. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was, it was down to the wire because they, they so were you trying to delay this? Um, I mean, we were hoping he'd get there on time because, um, he was supposed to come in the night before and they, um, his flight ended up getting delayed out. And so he missed his connection in Dallas. Um, they were like closing the doors as he was running up and they wouldn't let him on the aircraft. Oh. Um, so he ended up having to spend the night and then take the first flight out the next day, which was landing in Pensacola at the time that my ceremony was starting. And so um, had a friend prepositioned at the aircraft uh, or at, at the airport. Um, again, Colonel Manning was there waiting for my husband to pick him up. Um, he flew in his service dress and, you know, I kind of prepped um, the people running the ceremony. I was like, he may or may not make it. I don't know. Um, and so the whole time I'm like looking at my watch, looking at my watch, like it was the shortest graduation speech ever. Like you always want the guest speaker to go to be quicker. This one, I, you know, he was really quick and I was like, dang it, man. Um, of course. Yeah. My sister is texting my husband the whole time. Like, where are you? Like case up next in line, all these things. And, and so she's getting real time updates and I look at my sister and she's like, Oh, I don't know. And so I walk up to the stage. It's my time. I look at the narrator and, um, he just looks at me and I shake my head and he's like, oh, dang, because he, he knew what that meant. 
And so he announced me and said, okay, you know, Lieutenant Hula is going to get um, pinned on by her parents. Her husband missed his connection flight and wasn't able to make it here today. And the crowd's like, oh, sadness, oh, terrible. And so walk across the stage, um, get my aeronautical orders, get my wings, walk up, um, hand the wings to my parents. And my parents are like about to put the wings on my chest, like moments away. And I hear, wait, stop, no. And I turn and I look and the O club doors are bursting open. My husband is like running through, like cinching up his tie on a this service like a dress. It, it, I, I told you, epic man. It, it was, it was, it was so bizarrely epic movie. Like you know, he's running up to the front. Everyone starts crying. Like I'm crying. It and so he got there just in time to pin on my navigator wings and wow. it was yeah it was it was super epic and you know people afterwards were like did you plan that i was like no <laughs> he missed the entire ceremony well that's no, how that, that. that's how unbelievable it was though <laughs> yeah you know, it was such a beautiful unbelievable moment that you we've only seen on movies yeah it, 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 right it looked scripted um, and it happened to you in real life yeah like, I, I had people months and months and months later um when i would go back for friends wingings say oh my god yours was that graduation i'm like yeah that was me it's like a thing of legends now yeah you know it's a story told to all the classes yeah it was it was it was pretty pretty epic um so those are called like synchronicities where yep. the unbelievable happens that connects us mm -hmm. where it's just again Kate, you're surrounded by these synchronicities. <laughs> and I and I think that that's a good thing. I yeah. really do. I think that that means that your intention and your heart is poured into everything you do. And those things show up in these synchronicities. You know, this spiritual thing. It's happening to you, Kate. You're surrounded by it. Yeah. God, God's got a plan. Um, I wish he'd clue me in on these things sometimes, <laughs> but, you know. Right. And yeah. another weird synchronicity is, is Dr. Badass and our connection to her. Yeah. I mean, really. Yeah. So I'm even getting roped into this <laughs> you orbit go. that you've created. You're sucked into the. I got sucked into yeah, that orbit. The gravitational pull. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Jeez. Okay. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, okay. So, but you know, you've also been through an intensely, intensely difficult times. You know, with your own health and your own life, and yeah. the, the, the situations you were put in. It's not been easy by any means. Uh, and so, was that delay on your PT test what made you the senior ranking member of your class? No, so that, that um, PT test delay was um, for navigator school. Um, and so, when I went to pilot training, um, I, I don't think I sat on casual status particularly long. Um, but again, great that I was on casual status at the time because that was when... Um, uh, Rose's boyfriend, um, Matt Rowland, was killed. And so I was able to go to the memorial and be there and, and, and support her, which was great. Um, and then got back shortly after that um, and then started pilot training. Um, and so um, I was a senior ranking officer because I was a captain when I went to um, pilot training. And um, technically, I wasn't actually the senior ranking officer. Um, it was a, an army captain who had um, transferred into the uh, Air Force Reserves, um, Jeff Bordenave, who, you know, it's very weird when they transfer from Army into Air Force, they don't, they don't go through Air Force training. And so, you know, he, he didn't know how to wear the uniform or like a lot of the Air Forceisms and stuff. And, um, Great. yeah, so, um, our, our, uh, flight commander, who's, you know, very, very, very good friend now, um, took one look and he's like, no, no, um, you should not be the SRO, but thank God made him my, um, assistant SRO or ASRO. Um, and so then I became the, the SRO. And so the two of us together were, were a pretty great, um, team because he's very B type personality. I'm very A type personality. And I need that person to be like, Kate, let's, you know, not everything is, is as important as you might think it is, or let's, let's rein it back in. So he's your voice of reason. Yes, he was very good um, at kind of uh, bringing balance to me. Um, and so I, I'm just incredibly grateful for, for him um, and our, our flight commander, Jordan Grove, who was um, killer. And he, he's, he's super cool. So um, he, he did the, um, the pilot doctor thing. Um, so he's a... A, a flight doctor? No. So he is a Air Force pilot who went through med school. And I've so, only met one of those, yeah, uh, and it was a helicopter pilot, yeah, and so I've only met one person. That's a very, very, very well, because 
you know, there's so much school involved time wise. It's almost not so possible uh, to fit all that and then have this career, which we also have a timeline on, right? We can't stay yeah. in forever. So that's it. Those people, are, I don't even know how they do that crap. They're, yeah. His whole family is like these crazy overachievers. And I think um, when you're, when you're looking at his family, he's probably the least achieving, which is just that's, insane. Was, like, what yeah. is it, like politicians right. in his family? Like what is going <laughs> right. on here? Yeah. No, that's but, amazing. Yeah. I've only met one uh, at, at Luke Air Force Base and I was like, why do you got all this helicopter stuff? Yeah. He's acting as a doctor there. And he's like, mm -hmm. Oh, I'm also fly helicopters. I'm, you know, I'm a pilot in the air force too. And I'm like, yeah. What is happening? Like, who are you? Apparently, they need to get all the women. So. <laughs> Apparently. Like, oh, I'm a pilot doctor. <laughs> like, when does it okay. end with you, man? It yeah. doesn't. I'm just getting started. Exactly. It's like the, the Navy SEAL who was like a, became an astronaut and was, you know, right. just could not do any, like, no limit to his talent and ability. Yeah, but. his name's David Goggins. So yep. <laughs> yep. Um, so yeah, um, our, our flight commander was was uh, incredible, and so um, had kind of that foresight to say, okay, you two together, um, and so I became uh, the the SRO for for my class, which is um, really cool to get to be um, in charge. It's, it's difficult to be in charge of um, your peers. Thankfully, I, I was of a higher rank. The problem is that you're a student, and so I ended up having all of the responsibility, but none of the authority. So I kind of had to create this sense of authority um welcome to being enlisted yeah no, yep. just kidding. <laughs> right yeah um god that's for sure um so it, it was definitely interesting but again god knows what he's doing in my class was just phenomenal group of individuals that were really responsive and and very good at um you know when we kind of established how things were going to go um just responded very very well to it and, and that's where the servant leadership for both sides kick in yeah can you treat them do you, are you comfortable enough mm -hmm. with that role to treat them with respect and know how to approach your peer? Because approaching your peer is a whole different yeah. ball game. And then on the flip side, are they going to support you? Or are they going to give you the hardest time and try to exclude you? Yeah. Right. So I, th I feel like the peer to peer is the, if I see peer to peer working, then I have a lot of respect for that team because I know they put their pride aside yeah. and, and they're supporting each other. You know yeah, what I mean? Absolutely. I, I think it helped that I was uh, significantly older than everyone, too. Like I was Call sign mom. Yeah. I mean, I was almost a solid decade older than most of the um, other guys in my class. Like, our our very first thing, we were sitting around waiting for some medical stuff, and they were, they were talking about the new Pokemon app that was coming out, and I was like... Pokemon Go. Yeah. I was like, oh my god, are you guys the Pokemon generation? And they're like, yeah. I was like, holy crap, my, my little nephews, Mike's little nephews, when I met him, I was like, they were the Pokemon generation. I was like, holy cow, um, we're, we're very different in age, aren't we? And um, for, for a lot of the folks in my class, their favorite game to play was how old were they when Mike and I got married? Um, and the upsetting answer um, in most cases was second grade. So... <laughs> Holy cow. Yeah. Wow. We, we we got married young, but uh yeah, there were there was a there was a significant age gap. Um but they man, they were they were just great to me and they're really responsive to both me and Jeff um as far as, as listening and, and us working together as a team towards a common goal. That's amazing. And you said yeah. you're forty years old? Yep. Yeah. Okay. I'm thirty eight, so I'm yeah. we're right <laughs> I mean we're right around that same generation. Yep. Uh so yeah, and you don't look that old at all, by the way. My I God. like you. <laughs> I, I thought I was older than you. I mean, honestly. So you're you're killing it in so many areas. You're my new favorite person. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> I'll just follow you around and tell you how young you look. Yeah. Every day. I'll just yeah. tell you. And I'll tell you text. how great you are. Still so, looking young. Yeah. Partnership made in heaven. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, okay. So your senior ranking, mm -hmm. um, you got a bunch of young younger you know peers yep. depending on you relying on you gave you the call sign mom yeah which i think is the biggest compliment <laughs> to give a leader if they if you name them after a parent just right i, I think that is a compliment yeah um when i was an exec i called my colonel mom once <laughs> it, it's on not accident. a matter of if but when you do that like it's I, calling a mom or dad and telling them you love them accidentally like, i could not believe that that came out of my mouth <laughs> i was in disbelief mortified that's and fantastic I, said, I called her mom i was like <laughs> her name's colonel crystal henderson um and 
we both laughed at it but i was like honestly that's the best compliment like i didn't mean to call you that yeah but the fact that i look at you in that role means i trust you and believe in you yeah you know that was the that was like the best accidental thing i could have said definitely but it's something i'll never compliment. forget yeah <laughs> i think about it at least once a week i'm in the shower and just like God, josh why did you mom really okay we've all been there yeah yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay so run me through you, you put some pretty heavy stuff in there yeah um pretty alarming stuff that is very very difficult uh i, I would assume to even bring up yeah um, but if you're comfortable with it letting me know some of the the trials that you and your classmates went through during that that time for sure. And, and, you know, as difficult as it is to talk about, I try and talk about it a lot because I think it's um, a really uh, important story and it was, it was just such a significant lesson um, for me. So we, um, as the SRO, you know, I was kind of in charge of, of taking care of my class and leading them. And so we had just finished um, probably the most difficult test in all of training. It's the weather test. Um, it, it is a really difficult academic test that you do. Um, and we had all passed, and it was great. And so that that's that doesn't typically happen. Um, you'll you'll have someone fail, and they and they have to kind of you know do some remedial training and take it over again. Um, but we had all passed, which was just a huge success to us. And so we were getting our first flights in the T6. So it's it's the very beginning of the training phase where, you know, you've done a few sims and you're now going to go fly the, in the aircraft. Um, and so we were getting what's called our dollar ride. Is that a pilot and co-pilot? combination or is this a solo flight um so it's an instructor and then student pilot so there's two seats in this yes okay mm -hmm. yeah front seat and a back seat and so um the the dollar ride um we call it that because um tradition says you give your instructor um a dollar in some sort of manner and it's really fun to make really clever creative gifts um uh my good friend tim nichols made all of mine for me because he's taken the dollars and like made them into airplane sculptures like origami um, um it, ish <laughs> um i'll have to show you some pictures it's, it's epic what he's been able to do um he's made a um a da20 um he did a c130 he did um a t6 a t6 texan 2 um he he's a t38 um it it's wow. amazing. So That's like, insane. yeah, okay. I, I had, I had an inside person who, who made a great dollar, dollar ride gift. Um, but, but the, the tradition is that like you pay for your first ride and then you have to earn it after that. Um, and so do dollar ride day is, is huge. And so we were all kind of getting our first flights and this is a um, ride of passage. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, it's the beginning of that flight journey and the T6 Texan two is such a fun aircraft. It is, it is so nimble. Um, it is so responsive. Um, it is so forgiving and it is just fun to fly. And so dollar ride is great. And it's great for the instructor pilots too, because they get to show off and, you know, kind of show what it can do and have some fun. There's not a lot of expectation for you as, um, a student at that point, because you don't know much yet. Um, and so it's just a great time. So it's low, low stress. Yeah. This is an exciting moment for you. It, exactly. Okay. Um, some instructors can make it a little bit more uh, stressful than others, but um, uh, mine was great. And it, it was it was just so much fun. Um, and so, you know, really great successful day. Everyone passing the weather test. Everyone starting to get their first flights. I had gotten my dollar ride. Um, and so one of, one of the guys um, in our class, um, Ben, came up to me um, that day and said, you know, hey, um, I... I, I don't think I want to do my dollar ride. Um, I don't know that it's safe. I'm, I'm kind of stressed out about this. Like, I just don't think it's a good idea. And I was like, okay, well, you know, talk to me about this. What are you feeling? And he said he had been dealing with some anxiety, um, just didn't think he was going to do well and didn't think it was safe, didn't think it was a good idea and was thinking about dropping um, the pilot training program. So this is very alarming thing to say at this, you know, yeah. moment that he passed everything, you mm -hmm. guys are riding this high you are celebrating and you're going to share this special moment and so you know how strange that someone is saying this is the point that i think i should step away yeah before even trying it and and for me that's a challenge um especially you know at that point having struggled for you know 10 15 years to get to that point to earn that position it's hard when someone new isn't even going to try um to do it that that's that's difficult personally for me to hear um, what did that strike you as hearing that what, what were what were you thinking 
was going through his mind? Um, I, I thought he was way too hard on himself. Um, there, there were a couple of things like, um, you have to do tests called bold face and ops limits. Um, and, and they were kind of like your emergency procedures where, you know, like if, if, you know, this emergency happens, here's my corrective actions. Um, and then you learn the limits of the aircraft, things that, you know, you don't operate outside of those limits for the safe operation of the aircraft. Um, and, and there was one where like, he was supposed to review one and he missed something and I found it and corrected it. It was no big deal because um, we were practicing this um, and he was just extremely hard on himself about that. I was like, man, this, you know, kind of not, not a big deal. Just, you know, attention to detail next time. That's why, we, why we're practicing and why we're doing this. Um, and then he was supposed to have a sim um, that he ended up not getting to do because they hadn't gotten his um, helmet done in time. But um, he ended up thinking he failed it. Like, he was just like, I failed it. It's my fault. Like, I should have done that. And I'm like, but man, that's not your, your job to, like, make your helmet. Um, and so, like, I knew he was a bit, he was kind of hypercritical on himself. And so I was like, man, he's just being hy hypercritical again. Um, I know he's, he's stressed out. So you thought he was just getting in his head again. Yeah. And you're like, I got to I gotta talk him out of this. Yeah. It, it, that environment is wickedly stressful too. And, and by design, um, you know, these are our future Air Force aviators who are going to go in, into combat. Um, and so you need to test people, you need to push them, you need them to see what their limits are and then go beyond those. Um, it's very unforgiving though, when you don't, yeah. when you come up short, you know, it, it don't matter how much you're liked mm -hmm. or, or anything. If you don't make, it's, it's black or white, pass or fail. You know, you only get yeah. so many shots and then that's it. Yeah. You know, I just had a buddy get to the last test in EOD after a year, mm -hmm. fail that test, and now he's back in months. Yeah. You know, it, it's black or white. It's brutal. It's, a stre it's stressful when you realize, you know, either I'm going to pass or I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> There's no debate. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and thankfully, um, within pilot training, they, there are... Um, there are options and there's kind of um, some, th there's a little bit of grace in it in that they know how challenging the training is and they know not everyone's going to get it perfect. Um, you know, like I failed a couple of rides and, you know, a lot of people end up failing a check ride. Like it, that's kind of standard that you're going to fail at some point. Um, but then they do the training and just make sure that you, you know what you're doing. Um, so th thankfully they've got some of that built in to understand the, the challenges and to kind of um, work with that to hone you. And, and that's a lot of what the, the pilot training is, is, is honing um, you to be an aviator and you're not going to get it right initially, but man, that pressure when you're going through it is intense. Um, and, and you feel like everything is black or white. You feel like, if I don't do this right, then I'm going to fail. Um, and so it, it's a lot and it's, it's absolutely by design and it's absolutely has a purpose. Um, and I, I know what a great aviator it has made me, but it, it's, it's a lot to go through. Um, and so, yeah, I was like, he's, he's being too hard on himself and I need to talk to him. His name's Ben. Mm -hmm, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so I, you know, I was like, look, we love you. Like you're amazing. We don't want you to drop the class. Um, why don't you just try it? Like, just try the dollar ride. Like there, it, there's no pressure in this thing. Just go have fun and just see if you like it. Um, and he's like, you know, I just don't think it's a good idea. I don't think it's safe. Um, and so we, we talked for a bit about it. Um, and then ultimately agreed that, you know, we would, we would talk about it the next day and, and go and talk to our, our flight commander and just see what options there were at least so that he could kind of make a better decision. Um, but as we were talking, every single thing inside of me, was saying, hug this boy. Like everything inside of me is screaming, hug him. Um, but I had this very clear argument in my head where I said, no, you are supposed to be a leader. You are not supposed to be this emotional female. You are supposed to be a leader and firm and take care of him. And I very clearly talked myself out of it. And I was like, nope, that's not, that's not what you're supposed to do. Um, you're supposed to lead. You're not supposed to be um, emotionally sensitive. Um, and so I, I definitely told him we loved him and we wanted him in, in our class. Um, but, you know, everything inside of me was telling me that, that there was something going on um, and I needed to pay attention. And, and I very clearly suppressed that because I felt I had to meet this kind of set ideal that I had kind of been presented with. Um, and so um, I, I was 
I was worried about him. I, I went home that night and I called my husband. I was like, you know, I'm worried about Ben. Like he is, he reminds me of myself a little bit. Like he is overly harsh on himself. He's, he's blaming himself for some things that like really weren't his fault. Um, so I'm kind of worried about him. So like your, your gut and your heart was telling you yeah. something's not right here. Absolutely. And, and I kind of recognize like one of my talents is like my, extreme capacity to care. Um, I am really, really, really good at caring about people and taking care of people. Um, and in that moment, I was kind of pushing that aside because I, I felt that, you know, I couldn't be that um, and be a leader. Um, and so it, you know, my gut knew something was up. Um, and so the next day ended up um, getting to the, the flight room we had, um, first thing you do in the morning is called stand up, um, where they kind of grill you. And again, it, it, it's designed to get you to perform under pressure, um, like you're supposed to do in the aircraft. Um, and so it's super stressful and I was leading it for my flight. So, um, we have a flight and then you have two, um, you end up breaking up into two sister flights to kind of divide the work amongst the, um, instructors. And so, um, within my flight room, I was the one leading it. Um, and so I was kind of, um, in the hot seat for it. And so feeling intense pressure with that. Um, Jeff, who was my assistant in SRO, was doing the other one. Um, and so we got through it and I was like, oh, thank God, like that was really stressful. Now I get to go fly. So I was going to prep, um, make some copies. And I went into the copy room and talked to one of the guys who was in um, my, my sister flight. And um, I was like, hey, how'd your guys' stand-up go? And he's like, well, you know, it's really stressful because, you know, Jeff texted me beforehand and was like, hey, I'm not going to be there. I need you to lead it. And I was like, that's really weird. Like, why in the world would Jeff not be there. Like, this is the second day on the flight line. That's bizarre. And so I walked back by their flight room and I popped my head in and I was like, that's weird. Like, Jeff isn't here. Ben isn't here. I was like, well, maybe Jeff took Ben to like go talk to the squadron commander. But I was like, that doesn't make a lot of sense because like they wouldn't have not told me or taken me. And then it was like 5 30 in the morning. So I was like, okay, that doesn't make sense. Let me call Jeff and just find out what's going on. And so um, I stepped outside to call Jeff and um, got him on the phone. And I was like, hey, Jeff, you know, like, I, I know you weren't here this morning. Like, is everything okay? And he said, no, Ben's dead. And I said, there's, there's no way. Like, I, I couldn't, I was like, I couldn't have heard this thing right. Um, and uh, he had gone home that night and committed suicide. Oh, my God. Wow. And so um, Jeff was actually uh, the person who found him. And so, um, you know, again, just total dis disbelief because, like, I knew I was worried about him, but I had no clue um, that's, that's what was going to happen. And, you know, Ben was just this really, really, really gentle, amazing person. And so... Um, it just didn't, it just didn't fit with what I had seen. And so I was like, Jeff, where are you? And he's like, I'm over at the dorms. So I was like, all right, I'm coming there. And he's like, Kate, you don't want to be here. I'm like, Jeff, there's no way I'm leaving you there to, to go through this alone. Um, and so, you know, I raced over there and, um, you know, the, the medical professionals were there and, and EMT and fire and all that. Um, and so it was just the whole time driving over there. I'm like, the drive over is when you have time to think. Yeah. You're thinking things. The thoughts are racing through your head. The conversations you had, the signs you're looking for. Yeah. What was going through your head on that drive? I, I just kept thinking it didn't add up. I just kept thinking, like, there's got to be a mistake. Like, I'm going to get there, and, like, maybe he tried to commit suicide, or maybe he, like, accidentally took too many pills or something. I don't know. I was like... They, I'm going to get there and, and I'll discover that this isn't what happened. Like this isn't a, a, the finality that, that it is. And, and so it was, it was really just, I, I just couldn't reconcile, um, you know, what I had s spoken to him about and, and that experience. I was like, you know, we were making plans. Like the next day we were going to go talk to the flight commander. We were talking about possible jobs in the air force he could do if he didn't go be a pilot. Um, you know, it wasn't one of those things where he's, you know, it, it did not fit that cookie cutter mold of the way that we're kind of trained um, to, to think that these things are going to happen. Um, and so it just didn't add up. Um, and so when I got there and, and, and I saw the emergency vehicles and, and Jeff there and like, was like, this, this actually happened. Um, it, 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 like you immediately are in this like, you know, kind of like a fog of war where you're like just kind of reacting in the moment and um, 
some of your thoughts aren't logical because he and I were there um, and then our, our flight commanders were like, we need you to come back. We're going to need to tell um, the class what's going on and, and all of that. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to leave then. And, but like, again, the fog of war, you're like, you're in, you're in pilot training. And I was like, well, I have to go back to the flight room because they told me I have to go back to the flight room. It was just this very funny thing of um, the pressure and the stress in that moment, in that situation, um, and feeling like if you made any decision that wasn't right, that someone was going to die again. Like, it, it just became this odd, like, if I didn't do something correctly, um, that meant I was going to lose someone else. Um, it was really, it was really, really bizarre. Um, and so we went back to the flight room um, and, you know, at that point, leadership knew what was going on. Um, they ended up stopping the launch um, and, and bringing all of our um, our classmates back and um, ended up having to tell them what had gone on. Oh, my God. I'm so sorry, Kate. You know, you did, how long have you, did you know Ben up to that point? Um, not even two months at that point. Um he actually ended up um, rolling into our class from um, from a, another class. Um, he had a couple of medical things, and they and they rolled him into our class. And you know, we embraced him and we loved him. We were so happy to have him. And so that was um, it was it was I, I guess a little weird to feel that strongly connected um, to someone that you had known such a short time. But man, he was he was just gentle and kind and love like he would never not call me ma'am I'm like man we're CGOs we're classmates like you can call me Kate like this is okay and he you know he was always just super respectful and and just lovely and contributing and um taking care of everyone and so um it it was it, it was just a, a really crazy difficult thing to have to to go through um and you know, when, when I had been talking to him the day before, he's like, you know, I, I, I don't want to get in the way of the flight. I, I don't want to, you know, bring the performance down. Like, I, I don't want to be the person that's not, you know, performing the way everyone else is. And I was like, that, that's not what's going on. Like, we're, we're not there. That's not, that's not what's happening. Um, but, you know, he did the one thing that, like, there, there's nothing else that he could have done that would have been so disruptive um, to us as a, as a flight um, and so I kind of learned a lot in that, in that, um, A, I, I kind of had this thought that like suicide was selfish. Um, I, I couldn't understand how a person would transfer their pain onto other people. Um, it, I just didn't understand it. But, um, when we lost Ben, knowing how sweet and wonderful Ben was, I was like, there's no universe in which he would have knowingly hurt anyone else. In fact, like he did it because he thought he was helping us. Um, and so I really, really learned the, the, you know, just dark mental place um, that he must have been in that moment to think that he was helping us in doing that. Um, and so that taught me a lot in terms of empathy and understanding for um, mental health disease, which, you know, I got one of my degrees in psychology, but, it, you know, until you kind of go through something like that, it, you just don't, you don't understand. Um, if you haven't experienced it yourself, it, it is hard to kind of conceptualize how dark um, and isolating um, mental health can be um, if you're in a bad place. And then the other thing I learned, um, you know, after that, I, I was like, never again, never, never again will I deny who I am. I will never again let someone tell me that um, my emotions are a bad thing. I'll never again let someone tell me that. Um, the traits about me that are kind of stereotypically female are a bad thing. Um, you know, emotions are an evolutionary advantage um, that we have that kind of inform us how we um, interact with our environment. Like that is what makes us human and how we are successful in, in interacting with our environment. And it's very bizarre to me that we say, you know, remove emotion from this. Don't be emotional. Um, don't show emotion. Um, when we need it. Um, it, it gives us an advantage and, um, I needed it in that moment and I suppressed it and, um, you know, I lost my airman because of it. And I, I just said, I'm never going to do this again. I will not let someone tell me, um, that my strengths are weaknesses, um, because I know that they're, I needed that in that moment. And, and we can't sit here and say things like, Oh, 22 a day is too many. And then pretend like we can take care of people by removing emotion. Um, from yeah. how we interact with um, 
with each other. And um, I, th I think that also was kind of an impetus for me as far as a lot of the work that I do um, in terms of kind of diversity and readiness when, you know, when I say we need diversity, it's because I've lived it. I have lived being told that I need to fit a certain mold and losing an airman because of it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I have, you know, I lost a national asset um, because there was one model that I was told I had to fit. And, um, and it was wrong. Yeah, it was, it was, it was absolutely wrong. And I, I will never, never do that again. And I will fight to make sure that um, people feel and understand that, that what they bring to the team, what they bring to the fight is what we need. Um, it's not something they should suppress it. It we've got to have all of the perspectives um, from all aspects to be able to, to tackle every possible challenge that we can meet. And, you know, it was the worst possible lesson I could learn, um, but um, it, it has been a driving factor for me since then um, as to how I conduct myself as an officer, as a leader, as a friend, um, as a family member. And um, it's your way of, of honoring Ben. Yeah. Yeah. Really. And how you, how you, what you control going forward, how you treat people going forward. Absolutely. You know, you, I'm sure you have been on your heart and on your mind with those decisions. Yeah. And, and, that that's why I try and share the story as much as I can, you know, and, and again, very uncomfortable to get um, emotional in front of others, especially uncomfortable to get emotional um, on tape and, and for public consumption. Um, but I, I think it's important to see. Um, and I'm amazed how many times when I talk about um, something, whether it's, it's losing Ben to suicide or, or anything else, because again, like I'm just a crier, like it's just what happens. Um, I'm amazed how many times afterwards I have people coming up to me, especially men, saying, I'm so glad you cried because it then gave me permission to cry and to feel the feelings that I had in that moment. Um, and so I think people are kind of starving for that and they want, you know, it's, it's a natural human condition. Um, and I think as leaders to be able to show that, um, that it's okay, that it's not a negative thing, um, and to remove the stigma and, and make it so that people aren't uncomfortable um, when you show emotion. Um, it, it's difficult. And, and really just very, very, very recently, I was, I was given the feedback that, you know, when I get emotional, I make men uncomfortable. And that, that's a direct quote. Um, and so I, I, know, I, I still kind of fight with um, working on that, on that stigma of it um but you know the, the more that i try and share ben's story um i think it really drives home for people there it, it's clearly a very extreme um example but um it gives others clarity and it gives you clarity yeah when you can find the words to there's a point in time where you couldn't even say it out loud yeah right yeah you couldn't even form a sentence to explain it yeah and now while difficult you can at least explain it and speak you know his story mm -hmm. um and that's empowering for you that's part of your healing for you yeah um so i think there's a lot of power in just finding the words to to say it to someone really yeah. truly but um I, i'm very proud of you for sharing it kate and don't let anyone tell you that your emotions are doing anything making people uncomfortable that's their problem um because that those are, I can feel your love, your emotions, and your heart behind everything you're telling me, and it makes me trust you. Yeah. Right. It's building trust, and even just with the the conversation we've had for we've been talking for two hours. <laughs> you're gonna have to do so much editing. I'm so sorry. I don't edit this stuff. <laughs> I just edit the beginning and the end, and but no, I don't. Or oh, if yeah. there's a or if I have to take a, a pee break. Yeah. That's the only thing I edit. I don't edit anything else. Your poor listeners are going to have to, we're going to have to build in some potty breaks for them. <laughs> but, but Kate, there's as a, as an enlisted, a senior NCO and as you, as an officer, just from what you've told me in this past two hours, if I were to come work for you today, there's nothing I wouldn't do for you to make it work, to, to make the mission work. There's, I would been, I would move mountains for you because of what you shared with me. And because I know the person that you are, because I trust you. And vice versa. And I, I think that's that emotional human connection that we are all looking for. And it's not some like squishy thing that's making the Air Force or the military weak. Like 
it's it's what's giving us strength. It's it's what allows us to continue to serve for 20 years, to do a full career, to continue doing 20 years of war and still being around and still believe in the mission and, and in the brotherhood and sisterhood that is the military. It's that human com um, connection and that emotion and that love for one another. Um, and, you know, the, the leaders that I have seen shown emotion um, – uh, it was the, the, I think the 20th anniversary of the 9-11, um, attacks and Lieutenant General Slife, who was the, um, AFSOC commander at the time, read the names of all of the AFSOC, um, fallen since 9-11. Um, and he got emotional during his speech and it was one of the most moving things I've ever seen and beautiful because I thought that is the man who is responsible for deciding if we're going into battle. And I can see through his emotion how seriously he takes that and right. that the loss of any one person impacts him personally, directly. Um, I can see and feel how much it means to him to know that he's putting lives on the line and what the loss of anyone life might mean. And that is absolutely what you want to know in your commander who has that responsibility and that burden and that accountability. Um, and he's now the half A3 and, and probably one of the best officers I have ever seen in my life um, and privileged to work for. Um, and, and seeing him be emotional was beyond moving. And, and so, you know, I, I wish more leaders, I wish more men felt comfortable doing it because I, I am amazed how many people um, respond in such a positive way that then gives them permission um, to feel what they're feeling and have that connection and trust. I only have one rule with emotion. Am I in control or am I not in control? Yeah. That's really it. Yeah. If I'm not in control, I may need to like take a minute. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Cause that's yeah. when stuff gets wild and, and permanent damage could happen. Right. But if I'm in control, I'm going to use it. I'm going to, I'm going to use it because people feel it in their soul. When you, when you speak from the heart. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you know, I, there is a time where I was like trying to do the same approach you had. No, I shouldn't do that. This is what a leader looks like. I'm going to be a little bit cold mm -hmm. in this situation. I'm going to be, I'm not going to share anything personal. And, and I got to tell you, I was miserable, you know, trying to do that. That's not who I was. Um, and I realized that for me personally, I was a coward at that point in my life. Looking back, I was just scared. Right there, there is nothing uh, you know brave about that approach I took. Yeah, I was actually scared. I was actually the opposite. Yeah. So I think putting up that front is compensating for fear of being vulnerable. Absolutely. I don't think it's real. Yeah, and Brene Brown talks about that as far as um, you know, fear and um, risk, and you know, the the connections of of all of that, and and it, it is a risk to be vulnerable, and and it's. You know, it's bizarre that it's shown as a weakness because you're you're really exposing yourself um, when you do show emotion. But that connection that you can create, um, just the comfort that you can provide to some person, knowing that that they're maybe not alone, or um, you know, somebody cares enough about them. Um, you know, after Ben died. Um, his family came out um, to to visit us, and, and we did um, a memorial for him. Um, I'm very good friends with the family and, and have permission to share this story because um, I wouldn't uh, if, if they hadn't granted that. Um, but they came out, and I was so stressed out because we knew we were all going to get together as a class and talk about Ben with them um, so that they knew who he was with um, during his final days. And I was so stressed out because I was like, I'm going to cry. I'm going to cry like an idiot. Um, like you talked about, like, I was like, I, I'm not going to be able to control that. Like that's, I'm going to be probably like, that's one of the most emotional yeah. situations anyone could ever be thrust in. Yeah. And I, and I knew I was going to cry a lot. Um, and it just, and this was it just happened. Right? Yeah. This isn't like a reunion. Like this is like right after. Yeah. Um, so you're not even done processing it. And now you're going to spend time with his the people that raised him, yeah. that love him the most. Yeah. And, and, you know, I was still really grappling with, a, and I still grapple with a lot of guilt and shame about it. Because, you know, l logically, would that hug have stopped him? No. Um, my, my brain can kind of say that. Like, my heart will never accept that, and my heart will never forgive me for that. Um, and so I, I was grappling with that, um, and, and I still do, but... Um, 
it was pretty intense at that time. Um, I was like, you know, I, I am the senior ranking officer. I'm responsible for these people. And I pride myself on my capacity to care and take care of people. And someone just felt that they were that alone, that, that they had to take their life. Like, I, I can't imagine any greater failure um, as, a, as a leader, as a person. Um, and so I, I was struggling with a lot of that. And um, they came out and we did this lunch. And everyone was sharing memories. And there were some great, wonderful, um, happy, positive, lovely, wonderful memories. Um, and then for me, I, like, of course they had me go last. And so by then, like, I'm just super emotionally charged at this moment. Um, and, and I talked about how much we loved him and, and my memories and cried like an idiot. Um, and I was so worried that I was going to make his family feel bad, um, that, you know, we were going through this and afterwards talking to his dad, Jim, who is just one of the most beautiful, wonderful people I've ever met in my life. Um, he was like, you know, it made me, he's like, please don't take this wrong. It made me feel so good to see you so upset because I knew how much you loved our son. And he said, I knew that his final days, his final moments, um, his, the end of his life were surrounded by people who loved him. And that was revolutionary for me to hear, you know, that my kind of very intense emotion actually provided him comfort because he could very visibly see how much his son was loved. Um, and that, and that he wasn't alone in the way that, you know, you might have feared. So, yeah. um, it, it, it was, it, it's been such an asset to me and I, and I hate that still, you know, like 13 years into my career, I still feel like, um, I need to hide it or not do it or, um, you know, be told that it, it makes people uncomfortable. Um, but I, at a certain point I just have to say, you know, I, I know the strengths that it is, um, and, and that it's okay. And that I hope others through seeing, me cry like an idiot, feel okay um, to do the same um, and show their emotion, their connection, their trust and love. I haven't met many people that care like you do. I, I know we just met, <laughs> but I feel like I'm a pretty good judge of character at this point. You know, 19 years served. Yeah. And I love talking to people and connecting with people and I can pick up on their energy and their intent. And I, I don't think there's many people that care like you do, you know, um, I don't think many people would think about that hug the way you do. Yeah. I don't think they would have even seen it that way, but you do. Um, because that's just who you are. You do care. And it is absolutely a strength. And anyone who doesn't agree with that might be, just like I felt all those years ago, terrified of leading and being perceived as weak and trying to hide that by any means necessary, like my life depended on it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we will go to great lengths to, to hide those egos. Yes. Sometimes. Yeah. And to not show our own vulnerability. Right. Um, and, and I think knowing that there's a person that you can show that vulnerability to, th there's not a single person that doesn't need that at some point in their life. You know, we're kidding ourselves if we think that you can be strong constantly or because you're in the military, you can be strong constantly. That, that is not reality, especially if you're talking, you know, 20 years of a career or 20 years at war. Um, it's just not realistic. And so the, the value of having those people that you can show that vulnerability to that you can say, I'm struggling, I need help. Um, I've got this thing going on and I, I need to show you where I'm at. Um, it's only going to make the military stronger because if, if we can then take care of ourselves in those, in those difficult points, then my God, how amazing are we going to be when we're, we're at our full capacity? 100%. Yeah. Wow. That was a very powerful story, Kate. Thank you so much for, I know that was hard to share and I, I wanted to cry. So like, it was, it was, you were getting, I was like, I mean, even someone who's been through military funeral honors. My, oh my gosh. I, I don't know how, how you do that. And, and hats off to all of our honor guard folks who can, um, you know, I've raised Catholic and I was a, a server and, you know, having to help some of those funerals. Like I'm like sitting there like digging my nails into my arm, trying not to cry very unsuccessfully. And I just hats off to you guys being able to, to do that. Um, They're kids that do it. They're 18, 19 year olds yeah. that are running those. So, I'm so um, impressed with, with what they can do. I mean, I know that I'm not the, uh, the topic of discussion today, but the, how, how I came to terms with it. Cause Going into it, I thought, how the hell am I going to do this? This is impossible. Yeah. Um, but it really comes down to 
the pride you get for knowing that because my, my dad said this and it's it's stuck with me ever since but he said the funerals aren't for the dead they're for the living and so with that in mind how can i be there for the family the honor guards there for the family in a way that nobody else can, can be nobody else can do that so the, the pride that you feel even is hard to, to take some of the, that off and, and put it onto you to share that to share it with them to get them through it to to give them a sense of pride like it, it's so it's such a powerful thing i'm willing i'm willing to and we collectively are willing to feel that pain with them to get them through it to to show their the pride of of that member that they lost you yeah. know it, knowing that no one else can replicate that service absolutely i you know we had a an honor guard for my dad's funeral and and that was you know the top honor that he could have had um and and that meant the world to us um as as a family to have that um and then a couple months ago i got to do i got to be a um pallbearer for um, a, a, a naval officer from NAS Pensacola um, who had died suddenly and uh, like knew she was going into surgery but so it kind of made some plans but um, her, one of her last requests was that she would have um, all female military pallbearers for her funeral. Oh, wow. Um, and yeah. Again, you get the synchronicities you run into. You know, you're, you're so about empowering women. That's a passion obviously of yours. Yeah. Uh, and, and now you're a, one of, I've never seen that. I, I'll be honest with you. I've yeah. been, I've done, I've seen hundreds, thousands of funerals. I have never seen an all female pallbearers, never. And yet you have. Yeah, it, it was, it was something really, really special and very lucky. Cause one, one of my actually instructors from, um, CISO school is now one of their, um, their squadron commanders, um, uh, Colonel Armandi, and she she knew I was out at Hurlbert and um, asked if I'd be willing to participate in it, um, and and knew what that would mean to, to would mean to me, um, and that was incredible. And and you know, sitting in the funeral, like, you know, I still cried, but um, that was that was such an honor of a lifetime. Um, and now it's cool because like the the group of us that did this, we'll we'll still share me messages, and we refer, we refer to her as our veteran. Um, and so when I go and visit um, Forrest Sibley, who was with um, Matt Rowland um, when they were both killed in Afghanistan, um, he's buried in uh, in Barranca Cemetery on NAS Pensacola. So I'll go over and visit him. Um, and so when I go visit him, I'll, I'll visit our veteran um, and send pictures and we'll, we'll put flowers on her grave and stuff. So wow. we, we feel like, you know, she's ours and, and she's a part of kind of our family now. Right. Yeah. Wow, that's that's powerful! Yeah. Holy cow! I can't believe you you got to do that as as a career. That's that's just that's incredible, and I just respect the heck out of um, all of those who who do those those honors and and having a friend who lost her boyfriend, um, what it meant to her to have him honored in the way that you guys do and, and that career career field does is, you know, my God, what what a high calling and blessing! Definitely, yeah. yes. Um, and you know, speaking of you know, just on the topic of suicide, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's a powerful subject, right? And a lot of people have a lot of strong opinions yeah. on that. And one thing I noticed in, in military funeral honors was that there's a, a preconceived notion or perception that a, a member who committed suicide doesn't get funeral honors. I don't yeah. know. I, that's not a thing, mm -hmm. but people think it is. Yeah. Or, or think reason. it shouldn't be a thing. Or, or right. Yeah. And I really wasn't sure where I stood on that when I first joined. That's something I hadn't really thought about. Um, but there is this guy that changed my life. His name's Jeremy Rutherford. He's one of the earliest episodes that I've, I had, maybe like the third or fourth. And he was my go-to right-hand man for Honor Guard because he knew it. He, he's, he's done it for years, longer than anyone at the base level. And he rewrote the whole policy later. He changed the entire career field later. Wow. He was meant to do this job. And I had him in my office. <laughs> um, but he was, so in, he was so into it. It was intimidating, you know, being new. And I'm kind of aloof. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm kind of a goofy guy. And, and it's such a serious role. I'm like, man, I'm not anything like this guy. Like, how am I going to do this? Like, holy cow. Um, but what he taught me the most, though, was about suicide. Because as strict as this guy was and as, as tough as he was, he lost his brother to suicide mm -hmm. and like hearing that yeah. seeing what it did to him how passionate he was about honoring his brother 
just learning that journey, any airman who committed suicide, I would make damn sure they got the best honors possible because yeah. of hearing, you know, Jeremy Ruth Burton, how he lost his brother. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'll never forget a shirt kit. We lost a member at Team Whiteman, and they were really debating on, like, acknowledging it as a unit. Mm -hmm. Right or or should they just transfer the remains and and just forget about it? Yeah. Again, I came back to it's the funerals, the ceremonies. It's you got to think about the living too. Yeah. It's not just about honoring the member; it's about closure. Yeah. And so, like, it came down to like our decision. Like, I remember their shirt was like absolutely not. And the commander's like, "Well, can we?" I, I hats off to this commander. He invited us to get our take on it. That, that's that's impressive. Right. That's pretty cool. I've, that's yeah. never happened to me yeah. before. And so I went to this meeting, me and Jeremy Ruthford, and, and we said, look, it's your, your team is hurting out here. How do you think they're going to feel if you just ignore it? Like, can we you, – you need to do it for them, mm -hmm. too. Think about that. And so we ended up having the active duty ceremony in his hangar for closure for the unit. And I stand by that decision, you know, that that, heal, that helped heal that team. Yeah, and, and that healing is so important for those who are kind of uh, left behind, the, the survivors who kind of have to uh, move forward with, with that grief and that guilt and, and kind of honoring what they've gone through through um, those military honors is, is you know, you, you can't overstate how important that is. Right. Yeah. Well, I wanted to share that with you just because I feel like it kind of ties in with, you know, your beliefs from what you've been through. Yeah. And, and, and I still see people say things like, you know, suicide is, is selfish. And, and, and I was there. I, you know, I, I had believed that because I just couldn't understand the, the disconnect. Um, that you know there's this there's this incredible painting in um the montgomery arts museum um which phenomenal museum um you wouldn't think that you would find such a, a hidden gem in uh, montgomery alabama but holy cow um it's in the middle of blount park which has the alabama shakespeare festival which is just top-notch world-class theater again super big shakespeare fan I mean, that's all you right there yeah yes Dang. everything i love um absolute shakespeare theater snob and they are world-class amazing and so in blount park is, is the alabama shakespeare festival um a little bit of a misnomer because it's it's a like eight, nine, ten month season, um, and they do more than Shakespeare, um, and it's not necessarily a festival, but um, world class theater. But they also have the Montgomery um, Fine Art Museum, which is um, incredible. They've got like a, an actual hopper who did um, Nighthawks, um, which is, was kind of morphed into the um, uh, the one where it's like James Dean and, and Marilyn Monroe at, at the at the diner at night. Yeah. Um, oh wow. So, yeah, so they've got a hopper there. That's um, beautiful art. They get like a traveling show in, but it, it's it's a great, great museum. So if you're in Montgomery, Alabama, and honestly, like what person in the military hasn't been, right. um, go check out that their fine arts museum. Um, but there is a painting in there, which I had always liked because it was just kind of striking, but it was this like black painting. And you think it's all black. Um and I'd always liked it and admired it and thought it was good. Mm -hmm. um, but it was after losing Ben to suicide that I went and I, and I looked at it and I really saw it for the first time where um, it was, you could tell there was like a black, like the whole thing is black. Um, and so then they just use kind of um, uh, material. Um, to, to layer it? To, yeah. To, to give it depth? Yeah. And so it, there is a black precipice and then beyond that is just a black void. And if you stand in front of it, um, having lost Ben to this, it, there was this moment where I felt like this must have been what Ben felt. Um, it, it felt so consuming, so isolating, like you couldn't see anything but darkness. Um, right. And I just sat there and cried because I was like this, he couldn't even see the impact that this was going to have on his family, on his friends, because his family are, you know, the Walders are some of the most incredible people I've ever met in my entire life. They are just lovely, beautiful, giving, wonderful people. Um, and and he he never he he would never have done anything to hurt them. And so um, he he must have been so lost in, in that void and that blackness and that darkness. Um, and, and so it really did teach me that, um, it, it's not about anyone else. Um, 
you know, as much right. as you may be hurting it, they had no concept that that's right. what they were going to cause. Right. And so they deserve that honor. They deserve um, the recognition and, and the family deserves that healing and the friends do and the Definitely. unit. Yeah. Absolutely. What's up everyone. Josh White here. Thank you for listening to the end. Seriously. It means the world to me. And it says a lot about you because that means you either care about Kate or you care about the message. And either way, I thank you for that. We have one more part. One more part. Part three. Next Wednesday, join us again as we close out this chapter. We close out this episode, The Hero's Journey of Kate Hewlett, when she reflects on her career, the highs, the lows, and how it's so important to make every day count, staying true to yourself, staying authentic. You don't want to miss it. It's next Wednesday. All right, y'all. Well, this is me and my son, Phoenix. Again, thank you for joining us. We're going to see you next week. See ya. Say bye, Phoenix. Bye.